Thanks for letting me know. Yeah. Uh, I pull back to my office and Said maybe something like that was wrong. And, yeah. So um, we're just going to continue on from last time, I guess, um, where we were looking at you know, the process of doing the running conference. Once again, I'll reiterate until you're sick of me saying so that the point is not always the solution, which in this case, the sort of you all know, or many of you know. The point is the process. So it's not the journey of the destination, it's the right stuff. But in this case, that's be true. And so the point of dividing conquer is to understand exactly a particular algorithm design paradigm. And we've looked at this paradigm already. And what we have today to do is to understand how to show that it actually works. In other words, we've got the well-specified part down correctly. And so today we're going to look at how to make sure it's correct and how to get it done. OK, that's the plan for today. So just a quick review. We looked at this procedure for doing divide and conquer. Right? Um, and I think we ended up with uh, this basic, uh, not here, this basic paradigm here. And our goal is now to analyze the behavior. Um, that's what I talk about today. Now, the thing with dividing conquer methods, so if you think about how to prove correctness, right, you have to show that for any input, no matter how messed up or how unsorted it is, this method will always give you the correct answer. It does not mean that for the inputs you implement and try it on, it gives the correct answer. It does not mean for all inputs you can imagine it gives the correct answer. It means for every input, including the ones you can't imagine. Okay. 
So this is a strong statement. Uh, it has to work all the time, and we have to prove it. And so if you think about the algorithm itself, right, it has some key steps that in some sense will control the decision making of the whole process. There is a step where, um, uh, where you do the recursion and or, or conquer. So it, it, so it turns out you can reason about this at this level. You can say, look, if I want to make sure this algorithm is correct, I'm splitting it into parts. I have to know what's happening on the recursive parts, and I have to know how they're being merged together. As, so in other words, as long as your the results of step two, the recursion, are good, and as long as you merge these good things correctly to give a good answer, then you would like to conclude that, in fact, this is correct. And whenever you have a problem where you need to reason about something based on the behavior of smaller bits of it, the thing that should pop in your head is, will induction occur? Because that's how induction proves itself. Yeah. Assuming it's true for all the values up to something, prove it's true for the next one. So like a chain of dominoes, you prove it true for the base case, that's one thing. Then you prove, you said that it's true, as long as it's true for some numbers, it's true for the next one. So if it's true for one, it's true for two, it's true for two, it's true for three, and then you get the whole thing true for all. For all that. And so the, the method of proof for divide and any divide and conquer procedure for the most part is going to be by induction. And why is it going to work? We're going to say, well, look, we have solved the problem, so we have a problem. It's of size n, whatever n means for this particular problem. In this case, it meant the length of the list, so the problem might mean something else. We've divided into parts. Let's say this is size n1, this is size n2, right? And then we're sort of combining them together. So we're going to use induction, or in, more precisely the induction hypothesis, to show that this part is correct, to conclude that this part is correct by the induction hypothesis, because n1 and n2 are less than n. And then we're going to look at whatever is happening in this combined step here, to say, look, if you had correct things coming out of the recursion, which you assume by the induction hypothesis, and you did this procedure on them, what you will get is also correct. And that will complete the proof. Okay, so before we actually do this, it's important to understand why this is a complete proof. Because as I've said in this class, one thing you're going to learn is how to do proofs. Right? So why is this a complete proof? Because what it's saying is take any input, right? Assume it's true for some base case. And if you remember last time I had forgotten the base case, and one of you pointed out we need a base case. That base case is important because it says, look, for n equal to one, your solution is correct because your sorted output is in fact the single number, which is a sorted version of the input. So that's your base case for induction. Right. And then we have the induction hypothesis, which basically takes care of the reverse one. And so all we have to do is a step from if it's true for n for small n, it's true for the n plus one, which is your merge step. So basically we're going to be showing now that If correct for n prime less than n, then correct right? This is what we want to show, which is exactly what induction is. And the way we're going to show this by saying look at what the merge step does, the commerce. Okay. So so let's say what that what is that going to mean for this? What's that going to mean for this is now, so we will first say, um, let's look at the induction. So the induction claim is the algorithm correctly sorts all inputs of size less than or equal to n. This is the induction claim. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this induction claim. Add. It currently sorts all inputs of size and equal. So we need a base case. So the base case here, I C one, is true by definition because if you actually look at the algorithm, if the length is one, you return the value, which is exactly what you should do. So I C one is true. 
Right? So now our induction hypothesis is assume I C K true for all K less than N, strictly less than N. Right? Now there are different ways you can assume induction hypothesis. You can assume it's true just for n minus one. You can assume it's true for all. And in this case, we'll just assume this. Okay. And now we must show. Now we need to show that I C n is true. Okay, this is what we have to prove now, right? Okay. So we know that I C k is true for all k less than n. In particular, we know that in our sorting procedure. We divide the inputs into two parts of roughly half the size. And this is where, if you remember, I was saying it doesn't quite matter if it's n over 2, n minus 1 over 2. The point is both parts are strictly less than n. Right? So, so, so we know that, that the recursion right, takes inputs of size n1 and n2, which are strictly less than n. Right? If you look at it here, these two parts here, left and right, are both strictly less than n. Okay? <coughs> so in particular, if we go back to our proof, we can say that by the induction hypothesis, left and right, which are the two outputs, are correctly sorted. So you all see this, right? That, that merely by application of the induction hypothesis and the fact that we recursed on smaller sized pieces, smaller than n, the fact that they were able to did not matter at all, means that they're correctly sorted. In fact, to show correctness of this algorithm, we do not have to divide this into two parts of equal size. They can be of any size you want. It does not matter. The size will actually turn out to matter when you look at the efficiency. But for correctness, it does not matter. You could have one part besides one, one part besides n minus one, it will still work. Okay. So we know that's sorted. What's left to show is that what happens to the merge. So what about the merge process? What about? It? So what about? Now since we know that left and right are correctly sorted, we merely need to show that if we take two sorted lists and apply the conquer procedure, which if you recall was this thing here, that is correctly returns a sorted list. The sorted list being the union of these two lists. Um, and so there are different ways you can show this. You can show this also by induction on the size of the two lists. Right? So you can say that, assume the conquer procedure correctly merges two lists as long as their sizes are less than k. Right? Each of the sizes less than k. Now let's take two lists, one of which is size k, one of which is size k plus one. Um, you basically say, okay, so this is actually, a, let, let's prove it this way. So let's just uh, prove this way. So, so what about conquer? So again, we will prove that conquer is correct by induction. We will say so. Assume. So again, the induction hypothesis, induction claim here, as k is conquer is correct if both lists have size um, less than. Let's look at the base case. I C, let's say one. In the case of I C one, if you recall how it works, you just take the two elements, you compare them, you put the smaller one first, and what's left is the next one. You put that one in. So I C one is true. Right. And then the induction hypothesis. Um, oh, sorry. This is the induction hypothesis. Okay. So let's say we have now we have to show that this is true for value at k. So assume that I have two lists. So assume. I have left and right of size k. What's the first thing we do? Well, the first thing we do 
is um, uh, look at the first two elements of left and right. They're both sorted. So one of their first two elements has to be the smallest element in the final list. And we in fact compare them and put that one in. So that's good, right? So that, so that first step is correct. Uh, you put the smallest element in. And now it gets a little interesting. So now you have one list of size k, and you have one list of size k minus one. We can't yet apply the induction hypothesis, because we said both lists have to have size of greater than less than k. So there are a couple of ways to deal with this. We can change, we can go back and restart our proof all over again with a slightly modified induction hypothesis, which says that it's correct if at least one list has size less than k. But let's just keep going on with this. So let's say now we have two lists, one of size k, one of size k minus one. Right? So, so, we've got, so we've got two lists, we, we, they both had length k, we took off one element, so now we've got a case where 1 is k minus 1 and 1 is k. Now there are two ways this can go. Right? In one case, the next smallest element we pick is in fact the first element of the other list, which would correctly be in second place. Now we have two lists of size k minus 1, and now what can we do? At this point, what should we do to reason about the curve? Anyone? So remember our goal. Our goal was to show that the process is correct for all this of size k. We, we are guaranteed by the induction hypothesis that it's true for this of size less than k. So we've done this first step. We've looked at the first element, we take this element, we have correctly been put in the right order, and now we have two lists of size k minus one. What can we say at this point? You already assumed that for all the size less than k, it's correct. So. Good. So we've already assumed by the induction hypothesis that, this, that whatever we produce now is correct. We don't have to do any more work. Right? Induction and recursion is an exercise in being as lazy as you possibly can. Let the induction hypothesis do the work for you. It says it's correct. So now we know that things are correct here. In particular, what we know is that the output of conquer on this list will be a correctly sorted combination of these two lists of size k minus 1, which is going to be appended onto the first two elements by the way the algorithm works. Is that correct? <coughs> yes, because the first two elements are the two smallest ones. Everything else has to come afterwards. Therefore, that sorted plus this sorted has to be sorted. So now we have a correct answer. So this part of decision leads us to correct answer. Your name is? Okay. Okay. But what happens in the other case? Now it looks something like this. We have k. Um, we have k minus two and k, and I'm drawing this answer. So this is this is k minus one and k. This is k minus one and k minus one, and this is k minus two and k. Can we apply the induction hypothesis here? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah. Who said no? Someone? Yes? Yeah. Because because one is size k still? One is size k. It violates the claim of the induction hypothesis. Very good. Your name? Philip. Philip. Okay. So we can't do this, so we have to keep going. Right? So this has to keep going. And since I don't it doesn't want me to keep going, I'm going to do it. So it's gonna keep going and now so I'll just write it as k minus two and k. And again, there are two choices for what might happen next. At each stage, we are always, at each stage, we can be sure that the element we are adding in is the smallest of the ones that is left because the two lists are in sorted order. So we are always adding an element that is correct because it's the smallest of what is left. So we're always adding in the sorted order. But again, this, will, this could have two choices. This could be k minus 2 or k minus 1 and k minus 1, in which case, what happens? We slam into the induction hypothesis again, we're done. Or not. So you can see what's going to happen, right? At any point in time, if you touch that second list, you're done. The only way you can't reason that the algorithm is correct, you keep pulling elements off the first list. So what's going to happen? At some point, you reach some kind of case. Not here. Here. Where one list has become empty. Now you see why we need to have that last step. So every step in the algorithm actually is important here because without that caveat saying, okay, we put everything else in what's left over, you wouldn't be able to prove correctly. At this point, we now know that every element left 
is bigger than every element you put in. We also know that every element left is in sorted order by the previous induction plane. So now we can just string them all. So in other words, um, if you keep going, at some point you get to zero k, and now again we can apply the induction plane, or a different induction plane, because now we know that this, the list that came in to conquer was sorted to begin with. On any path of execution, we end up with the correct answer. And that's important. Therefore, the conquer step is correct. And if the conquer step is correct, and the two parts were correct, we now have shown that the inductive, um, sort of the proof we want to make, that given the inductive hypothesis for smaller values of n, it's true for, uh, for n itself, is done. So at this point, the proof is now. So this seems like a lot of work. And induction proofs can be messy like that. But I want to train you to sort of, again, to be able to do this kind of very careful reasoning, especially when the algorithm is no longer that obvious. Right? It's not so simple to see, okay, what's going on. The point is that you should first think, okay, I have to use an inductive argument for pretty much any divided problem proof that's going to work. So the, and, and then what we're seeing is that the key thing is that merge step. Right? The divide step is what the inductive claim is. Right? You just have to show that assuming correct inputs from the divide steps, I can actually merge them. Combine the answers. Okay. And that's pretty much how all correctness proofs work. And that's what we're done. Any questions about this? Yes. So it wouldn't look like that on the homework. It would have a lot of extra notes written in explaining what we're thinking. It would have the things I said, basically. Yeah. For example, assume LR of size k. You know, the first step is to take one off. So you would say the first step is to take okay, the yeah. first element off. You go to k minus one and k. It, the, then we look at the next element because these are in the correct order. Those first two elements will be correct, and we get to two cases. So we're just explaining it in words. In words. Okay. But you have to. You have to. Yeah. You have to say that. What What claim did you make such that that last case, that zero comma k, is obviously true? Good. What are the words? Like? Very good. So let's go back to our description of the conquer procedure, right? In the conquer procedure, we said if one list goes down to zero because p1 went to length a, add all the remaining elements to the new list. So when we get so let's go back to this one. So we are in zero k. At this point, according to the conquer procedure, we will add all elements of the second list to the final. We know from the call to conquer that all elements of this list must have been sorted because the recursive call was correct. Right? We also know that at this point, every element in this list is bigger than every element in the current partial output. Therefore, by adding the sorted set in, we construct a sorted one. Therefore, conquer returns a sorted answer. And that's kind of the, the cap to the proof. That's a gap to proof. Because what is the goal of the proof? The goal of the proof is to show that conquer returns a sorted list, a correctly sorted list. That's the goal. And so we have now concluded that conquer has returned a sorted list. Does that make sense? Yes? Yes? yes. Uh, this might be a bit silly, but I was just thinking instead of using a C value k, why do you use two different variables for the length of two different elements? Uh, so you are in, so uh, good. Tell me how you do it. Let's go back here. So my start of the claim, oh, let's assume both lists have size less than k. Yeah. How would you want to say it? Uh, both are less than a and b or something like that. Oh, no, no, no. So what is your inductive hypothesis? What is the induction claim you want to construct? You want to say something like, right, conquer is correct for all sizes. Mm -hmm. So you want to start off, what is your inductive hypothesis going to be? That it's true for? Everything. For what? Wait, wait, wait. Um, under a certain set. That's what I said. Okay. So, but how would you say it? Uh, maybe I would add one more step saying that uh, assuming two different arrays of sizes A and B which are less than K. So, you want to make the stronger claim that assume that conquer is correct for two arrays yeah. which have size less than K? A and B less than K. Isn't that what I wrote? Uh, yeah. In other words, you're going to specify actual sizes for them. Yeah. The question is, why does that, how is that going to help you? Yeah, 
right? So that's, that's the point. So for example, the way to maybe make this a bit simpler would be to say, assume that conquer step is correct if either list has size less than p. We could do that. How would you write the base case? Then? The base case would not be sufficient to say both lists have size one. It would have to be, you know, one of them has size one, and the other one could be anything. So now you have to show that the base case is true, which means you don't need another inductive claim to show that if the size is 1, 10, 1, 15, 1, 20, it's still correct. You can do it, but you're not saving a lot of time. You're transferring the work into the base case so that you can now make the this case a bit easier. So in, so in other words, if I said, let's assume that the, the conquer is true if either the list of size less than k, proving my inductive claim would be very easy, but proving my base case would be harder. Not harder, but it would take more work. Because my set of, set of base cases would be much more long. So your base cases will be controlled by the way you construct the hypothesis. And they have to be compatible. This, this gives you an easy bit case. Does this make sense, this little point here? That there are different ways to do an induction proof. There's no single way to do it. But whichever way you choose, you have to make sure your base case and your inductive inferences work. So for the for proving it for one, you don't want us to just write true there, right? You want us to sh actually show that it's true for one. Right. So why is it true for one? I mean, do you want us to write that out when we actually do? I do. The base case. Okay. I do. Okay. So you look look through your proof and say because of the way I've written the code. Yeah. Okay. You know, in fact, it's a good way to it's a good way to detect small bugs in your code because if you haven't put your base case properly in your code. You'll try to prove it to that, oh wait a second, if it's one, it doesn't really work properly. That's a good way to detect a problem. As we move forward in the class, right, as you build up some confidence with the induction groups, I will you know, progressively focus my attention on other aspects of the way. So there are certain kinds of albums which you won't use in induction groups, you might use different kinds of proof arguments. So, the, 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 the degree of rigor I will sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, right? So I mean, at some point, by the end of the semester, I will say, look, I, I, I you know, as long as I can see what you've done, I'll say, look, I can assume, I'll assume you can write an induction. Like, but for now, I want to, this is, this is something you need to sort of work on. Okay. Um, once we're done with correctness, the next step is to see whether, how well we have to So as always, my first three checks correct, then we worry about its performance. There's no point showing that a new correct algorithm works fast. That's very easy. I just return the It's incorrect that it works fast. Now again, just like how there's a standard way to prove that a dividing conquer algorithm is correct, there's a standard way to prove that a dividing conquer algorithm is a certain kind of thing. Namely by looking at what I call recurrence functions. And the way to think about this is that because you're doing recursion, you're basically, you know, you're, you're invoking sort of smaller versions of the algorithm itself. So the way you're going to express the running time of the algorithm is going to be in terms of itself. So as always, we'll say, let's assume the running time of the algorithm is some T of n. And we have to be careful now, because in all these things, you, you, you know, you don't want to go down to the level of, okay, how long does it take these instructions to fetch a, a register from memory and put it into its local store? We're, going to, we're not going to go to that level of detail when we analyze. We're going to analyze higher level operations. And usually in an algorithms class, we're looking at things like arithmetic operations, comparison operations, logical operations like that. We're not looking at lower details. There are many good reasons why. One most important reason is that for the purpose of doing asymptotic analysis, these things don't matter. Constants don't matter if you want to get overall good things. I'm not saying this doesn't mean that you know, if you ignore growth, if you ignore constants, your algorithm will run fast in terms of clock time. What I mean is we're looking at the trend lines as a function of the size of the input, how the algorithm behaves, those trends do not change if you change the architecture. Now, if you run a quantum computer, then all bets are off. You don't know that for sure. That's another story. But at least with a classical computer, and I'm sure most of you, your laptops are classical computers at this point, this will not make a difference. That's important. Okay. Um, when we get randomization, even that statement is not entirely true. But for deterministic classical computations, everything I just said. So for the case of things like sorting, and, for, and, and this will become true, like I said, things like arithmetic operations, comparison operations are what we'll care about. And in fact, for sorting, often we only care about comparison operations, because that's the key operator we use <coughs> compared to the 
So we will first, so to, before we can analyze, we have to sort of specify what basic operations cost. So I'm going to actually say that I'm not actually going to look at the total one time. I'm just going to look at the number of comparisons. And in fact, we say that sorting is end logging time. What we're really saying is that merge sort takes end logging comparisons. Okay. And this is a legitimate thing to do because each comparison is a constant time operation, or it's or it depends only on the length of the representations of the numbers you're comparing, right? And sometimes you can compare things that are very complicated, and so that might take time, but that's like a multiple. So the number of comparisons times the time to compare to things. So we want to look at that, and we'll call that function c of n comparisons. The number of comparisons it takes to look at two inputs of size n. And again, this means it's a worst case. So c of n really is the the max over all inputs of size n size n of the time on time. The number of comparisons. So over all possible inputs, and this is what is often called, this is what usually is called the worst case one. Okay. So it's a worst case scenario. So what we want is some kind of upper bound. We want to say C of n is less than or equal to something. So how do we do this? We could say, well, let's look at the different operators involved in looping. And so if you look at what C of n is, it consists of two parts. You first divide your two pieces, and you sort them. Hey, that's recursive. I know recursively what this costs. It costs C of n. So it's like C of n1. If you have one list of size n1, you have to sort the other list of size n2. And then you have to do this merge step. Right? And this merging step takes two lists of a certain size, n1 and n2, and runs through them one by one. And it compares them. So let's think about that for a second. How many comparisons will we need? Merge two lists in one. And again, why? Yeah. No, you have two lists of size n1 and n, and you want to combine them into one single list. So you're saying the answer is one comparison. One step of comparison I'm doing. Is that correct? That's just for the first two elements. No, no, no. Remember, look, again. We have an algorithm in place. We have a procedure. Okay. Don't don't uh, start freelancing right now. This is my procedure. Tell me how this. Tell me how many steps this procedure will take. The answer is not one. Sorry. What's your name? Okay. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Smaller of the length of the two areas. So you're saying it will take the number of comparisons equal to the smaller of the length of the two areas. Can you explain that? That's fine, that's fine. It's good to sort of rethink as you're saying it out loud. So go ahead and keep going. Am I counting copies? But am I am I comparing? No, that's why I said the number will be equal to I just asked the number of comparisons. Yeah. And I mean I'm not sure because Sorry, what's the name? Anisha. Anisha. Uh, I think it is M1 plus M2. Okay, tell me why. Uh, because uh, in the worst <coughs> case, like, we may pick one number from here, and I mean, if, if you have two lists, one number from here, one number from here, and keep going to the end, and keep comparing each of the N numbers. I mean, so, okay, so I have N1 here, I'm under here. I compare. I take this, 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 and done. Okay, so that is one case. So what is the worst case? Yes, that would be n1. But how? Back and forth. Sorry? It would go back and forth. Exactly. Pick one from here, pick one from here, pick one from here, pick one from here. Can it be worse than that? Why is that the worst case? 
I mean, clearly that's a case. Yeah. Why is it the worst case? Right, what's your name? Uh, no, no, no. I, I agree with that. Why is that the worst case? I agree that's a case. I agree it's a case that seems like the worst case, but seems is not a proof. Why is it the worst case? Yeah. Uh, because you run out of elements after that, so that's the worst case. Uh, no, because one could become empty long before the other ones, so then it wouldn't be the worst case. So maybe if one goes to the very last element, it stops, and then you run the other one down. It's kind of hard to reason about what the worst case is. <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. The trick with a lot of proofs is to not try so hard. <laughs> You're trying to figure out some exact example which is the worst case. If you can, that's fine. But you don't have to. <coughs> When I say worst case, all I mean is give me a number so that no matter what you do, you will never take more than this number. So otherwise, suppose I tell you, okay, okay, I need to walk from here back to my office, and uh, what's the worst case? I'm like, oh, no, it, it'll take me less than a day to get there. You might all say this is ridiculous. Of course it'll take you less than a day. But I'm not wrong. And that is a worst case bound. Now, Obviously, I would like a better worst case bound. So I might try harder. Say, okay, maybe fine, 12 hours. If I were to crawl, it might take me 12 hours. Okay, even then it won't take me 12 hours. Okay, fine, it'll take me one hour if I'm crawling and maybe, you know, I went to stop by to get some coffee on the way. Fine, okay, well, it's an upper bond. But my point is that you don't have to exactly find the exact scenario where you will achieve some worst case scenario. You just have to show that there is some number that is guaranteed to a number bigger than the actual number of things we've done. And one way to think about this is this. <coughs> After every comparison step, what, you, what can you be sure of that must happen? No matter what you do, no matter what the outcome of a comparison, what can you be guaranteed of that will happen? Yes? The size of one of the arrays reduces to, I mean, not size, but the pointer would move one further. After every step, one pointer moves, right? And they don't go backwards. So if after every step one pointer is moving, and you stop when one pointer reaches the end, how many steps could you possibly take before one of them reaches the end? So again, I have two pointers. At every step something is moving. I don't know how they're moving. We don't know what's doing. But we do know that it stops when one of them reaches the end. What is the maximum number of steps that is possible before something reaches the end? Yeah? Is it the n1 plus n2 minus 1? It's basically n plus n2 plus 1. I don't need to know how this happened. I don't even know if they went in lockstep or one finished early. I don't care. All I know is if I wait long enough, if I wait n1 plus n2 minus 1 steps, at that point, they will be done. They may have been done 10 minutes ago. I don't care. But they're done now. All right? So the upper bound on the number of comparisons you're going to take is n1 plus n2. But what is n1 plus n2? n1 plus n2 is the total size of the area. OK, so now, now we're back here. This is going to be n. Let's put n. Now we have a fully specified, and this is called, if you don't know this already, the record solution. It's expressed recursively. We're expressing the function in terms of smaller values of itself. And now the question is okay, now what do we do? We have to solve this. Well, now we have one final bit of information that we have not used in the algorithm. We've used pretty much everything in the algorithm so far, mostly to prove correctness. But there's one final piece we haven't used, the way in which we split up the input. That we split up into parts that are roughly the same. Now, we know that N1 and N2, we know that N1 and N2 are roughly N over 2. 
So it might be that N1 is equal to floor of N over 2 and N2 is equal to ceiling N over 2 or something like that. For the purposes of a, so to do a kind of a mental analysis of this thing, we're going to pretend for now that, in fact, they were both exactly right. Now, there are a couple of ways to justify this, and I'll show you how to justify them. Right? And there, there are ways to sort of remove this justification. <coughs> but let's for now pretend that n was exactly a power of 2, or at least was e, well, n was a power of 2, so that every time you keep dividing, you'll get a power of 2, and you divide into so, so assuming <coughs> so then we can write C of N is equal to two C N over two. Right? Because I divide into two parts of the same as and now I have this reference in a much cube. Um, there are notes that if I haven't already pointed out to you, I will I will link to that you can look at. There's a standard, so there's a standard way to solve references like this. It's called the master. And there's one of those things where once you learn it, it's really just a little bit. So that so to solve this, you can do a couple of things. You can apply the master theorem if it works. If that doesn't work, you can what is called uh, the technical term is plug and chug, which I do not like. But anyway, you just keep on expanding it. So you can write this as so C of n is equal to um, 2 times, and now watch what I'm doing here, it's interesting, 2cn over 4 plus n over 2. Do you see why this is true? I just took the value for cn over 2 and plugged that back into the equation, right? Which is equal to 4cn over 4 plus n plus n, right? You can do this again, which will become 4 times um, let's see, 2c n over 8 plus n over 4 plus n plus n, which is equal to 8c n over 8 plus n plus n plus n. And I will note that in all three of these, and I also know that, that 8 is equal to 2. This is not an accident. Right. And you can keep going till this becomes this will become something, well, this will become 2 to the k times c n over 2 to the k, which is 1, plus k times n. Because every time you divide by 2, you add one more value of n. And at this point, you can, you can see what's going to happen. That when n is equal to 2 to the k, k must be log n. So this gives you 1. So this is what's called the plug and chug method. There's a lot of work. You can do it, but in general, if you can apply the master theorem, the master theorem would basically say, for a reference that looks like this, this is in fact the answer. And I will, I'm going to write down what that looks like. All right. Um, let's see. The final way to do this, which is often surprisingly enough the best way to do this, is just to guess. You start to plug in the value and see what it is. So let me just do this one. So I just showed you the plug and chug method to expand. The master theorem would say, the master theorem says basically this, if t of n is equal to a times t of n over b plus f of n, okay, um, then there are three cases to worry about. Um, case one, If f of n is less than some constant times um, okay, what I must Okay, that's one case, and I'll pull them on a second. Three cases. 
Um, and basically three keys to say. If the first case is true, then um, So the, so the master theorem says pattern match your, your, your recurrence relationship against these three cases. Right? And these three cases are, by the way, not always trivial to show. Uh, but if you can show that one of these three cases apply, then you can read off the actual answer directly. <coughs> so you don't actually have to expand it yourself. And there's a way to prove this by expanding the master theorem out and these three cases approach. It might look like to you that these three cases cover all possibilities. They don't, and I will leave that as an exercise for you to point as to why they don't cover all possibilities. Uh, the hint here is the fact that those these things have to be true for all n. So this is the first strategy. If you have a recurrence relation and it matches these things, you can solve it. The second strategy is just expand it all the way out and see what happens. And sometimes you can simplify things so you can solve it. The third strategy is guess the answer. Look at it and you get, after a while you start getting some experience, say, okay, I think this is this, plug it in, and see if it works. So for example, in the case of, um, um, so the third case of just guessing an answer, right? So we have the reference, if you recall, t of n is equal to 2t n over 2 plus n. I'm going to guess, E of n is equal to O of n squared. I'm just going to guess. It. Okay. So let's see if this is true. So let's make more specific. Let's say guess that T of n is less than or equal to C times n squared. Okay. We want to show this again by induction. So if that is true, then it's true for T of n over 2. So now we just say what is the right hand side going to look like? The right hand side is going to look like 2 times, so this is going to so, so, um, then we know that t of n over 2 is less than or equal to c times n over 2 whole squared, which is equal to c n squared by 4. So then 2 t n over 2 plus n is less than or equal to c n squared over 2 plus n which as n gets large enough is going to be less than or equal to c times n squared. Okay, because if n is large enough, the c n squared over two term is much bigger than n. <coughs> and therefore, we have now shown that t of n is less than or equal to um, uh, c of n squared, and we're done. So this is great, this guess works. But this doesn't tell you this is the best possible answer. This merely says, yes, we know for sure that t of n is less than c n squared. Which is okay, but like I said, you may not have the best possible analysis of your problem. So you can say, well, if that guess works, let me try a new guess that is linear. It's not quadratic, it's a linear expression. So now again, we can plug it in. You can say, well, if t is less than n, we know that t of n over 2 should be less than c times n over 2. That means 2t n over 2 plus n should be less than or equal to c times n plus n, which is equal to c plus 1 times n. But this is very bad, because c plus 1 times n is greater than. And that's very bad, because our original guess was that t of n was less than c. So this guess is wrong. So we know now at this point that t of n is less than c times n squared, but it's and it's bigger than c of n. 
And again, in, the, in this case, the answer is at log n, but you know, if you were lucky enough to guess it, you could guess it. Which is why guessing is a good place to kind of know where you think the right answer should be. If you don't know, then you can just essentially find your search to try and find it. So in general, when we have a divide and conquer reference, you're going to have a couple of different strategies, including the master theorem, which was the first one, or the sort of direct expansion, or something along these lines. And in our case, we just showed by direct expansion, and also by the master theorem. Uh, which you can see here. Um, here, since t of n is equal to 2t n over 2 plus n, you can check that in fact the third case of n is, and the answer is t of the t of n is equal to f, f of n log n, which is f log n. Um, and that's basically it. For, so we've now completed for our divided conquer sorting procedure of <coughs> correctness, and a proof that's running time is f log An interesting thing for you to ponder which I will ask you to ponder is this. Suppose we didn't split in half. So we didn't split in half when doing the divide and conquer. We just said that, oh, we'll just break it up somehow. Take a little bit here, take a little bit there. Then our records would look something like C of n is going to be equal to C of n1 plus C of n2 plus n and we don't know what the worst case values of these are. So it could be as bad maybe as C of 1 plus C of n minus 1 plus n. Well, C of 1 is 1, so this becomes 1 plus C of 1 plus C of n minus 2 plus n minus 1 plus n, which is equal to um, 2 plus C of n minus 2 plus n minus 1 plus n. It doesn't take much work to see if you keep doing this. You'll get n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus, and this will be basically n squared. So if you don't split in half, you actually get a much worse running time. And that intuitively makes sense because we're not splitting in some sense in a balanced way. We're not picking in large factors that are balanced. And so this is the important thing that I like to talk about. And I think when I talk about divide and conquer and about reference analysis, we think of designing the algorithm and then doing the analysis of the running time afterwards. But we often do this in reverse. We often say, look, I want an analog in running time. So I, from this, I know I need to divide things perfectly. I can't afford to divide this. So often, knowledge of how you analyze the running time of an algorithm helps you design the algorithm as well. Because you know that if you want a certain analysis to work, the algorithm has to look a certain way. So I want to emphasize that there's often this back and forth. That we don't often just design first and then analyze later. Back and forth to see how they improve things. Okay. So that's it for today, I guess. Um, just again to reiterate, if you want to prove a divide and conquer procedure correct, you use induction. If you want to prove something called a starting time, you use reference relations. And next time we'll see a different problem and we'll apply all of this more quickly. So we can go through and see how exactly it works for, for another example. The, no, the, the minus 30 seconds or one minute that we have. If there's any quick question, I'll take one quick question, otherwise we'll read between the Friday and talk more about Any one quick question? No, okay, I'll get a couple of these things and I will um, point you to the relevant portion of the, the reading in the temporary signals where you can read more about the reference question. I'll say a little bit more about it.